Uh, code base is all open source. Uh, currently, uh, yeah, EVM Gateway V2 on our Unruggable Labs. Um, we have this V2 sub. Um, that is also a good point as well. We do have conversion methods for converting from V1 requests. Uh, in practice, I imagine most entities would probably just want to um, rewrite their code with V2, but it is available um, if you uh, want to. It's documented, there is tests, uh, you can run tests, we have example code. Um, documentation at gatewaydocs.unruggable.com, which outlines uh, essentially what I've just uh, mentioned for getting started. And this is a living document, so we'll expand it over time. There are some basic uh, examples, but yeah, this is essentially how it works. If you have a Solidity contract, uh, I don't know how to get rid of that message, but that seems to be the, compute, the screen. Um, yeah, if you have a Solidity contract with a, a, a value type in slot zero, uh, you can use a builder request, you set the target, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, you specify how many outputs you want. Uh, so in this case, it would be one. You specify a target, you set the slot to zero, and then you read, and then you set the output of that read command uh, to position zero. Mappings and more complicated use cases. Um, you push the mapping key to the stack. So internally, this virtual machine is stack-based. Then you follow this, which uses the uh, Solidity storage layout rules to uh, generate the ID based on the key that's popped from the top of the stack. Then you read the bytes and set it to an output. Structs, um, similar, set the output number, set a target, set the slot, push one to the stack. Uh, add slot will increment the slot ID by the value that's at the top of the stack because um, for structs, the uh, well, it's as outlined here, the elements of structs and arrays are stored after each other. So once you've got to the slot position of the, the core struct, you simply increment it by one to get access to the name, read bytes, and set it in the output. Um, I know that not everyone here is necessarily technical, but that's just a, a basic um, uh, example. Um, but in principle, you would you'd have a resolve method that's... Uh, implements ENS IP 10, and you would just build uh, a request like this, uh, call fetch, and it would resolve. We do have our own um, verifier deployments. At the moment, we've only deployed onto Optimism, but we're gonna deploy the other one shortly. Uh, you can also deploy your own. You could deploy an owned version with your own access control as um, appropriate, um, but yeah. Uh, thank you, that, that's, that's great. Uh, any plan to support uh, a named storage? So recently there's an effort to push for uh, a new way to uh, assign storage slots in which it's using a, a human readable names. And uh, that was pushed by open, open Zeppelin teams. So I think it would be helpful to see how they play out in the examples, right? Yeah, so there is um, an API method called set slot where you can set a, a slot to any arbitrary value. So you could calculate it off-chain uh, or subject to any specifications or ERCs that are in process and read values. So that's that's out the box there. And I can add, uh, I can, I'll follow up with you and get find out what that ERC is, but we can add an example for that. I just wanted to ask the Requests you have shown us were a simple request where you retrieved the struct or a mapping, right? Do you have an example for a nested request you mentioned? Just like a high level overview, what can be fetched using a nested request? Yes, so not on the documentation, but that OP resolver example is a nested request. Um, So, um, yeah, this is documented in line, but this is for reading from our own attempt at uh, nested sub-registry architecture for V2. Um, 
but this is essentially it's, it's quite complicated to run through, but <laughs> you put push zero to the stack and then set um, output. Um, so you're setting that zero to the output in position zero um, because in this request example, we are requesting three outputs, the registry, the resolver, and the resolved address. So by default, we're starting with the registry as zero for the root. Um, then we push name hashes onto the stack. In our example, we're using name hashes. I believe that Nick's version is not using name hashes. Um, then uh, there's this sub request, which we create here. And then this um, eval method will essentially run this sub request against all of the items on the stack, subject to a flag that's specified here. Uh, you can require non-zero because obviously we need there to be a registry value. Um, and then uh, there's a, another nested sub request. Uh, I, I feel like this specific example, I should probably document more thoroughly on the, the website after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Rather than kind of trying to run through it all in this context. Oh, you've got a mic. Oh, hey. Um, is uh, Coinbase using this for cb.id? Uh, no. Um, I mean, not that I'm aware. We've They're <laughs> using some sort of CCIP read, correct? They oh. uh, wrote their own gateway before the V1 even was available of CCI or the VM gateway. What about Uniswap, uni.eth? So uni.eth, is that also CCIP read? Most of these entities, I believe, uh, operate their own... Um, gateways uh, and their own setups and their own smart contracts and I think part of this was that um, um, we've kind of spoken to uh, various entities who have been working on gateway stuff was that to deduplicate effort uh, and all work towards kind of an open source uh, solution for gateways that everyone can contribute to anyone from L2 providers or well any, any L2s, L, L3s um, can build their own verifiers in principle um, and build on top of this to, so that we have kind of a public and universal um, ever-growing solution. Yeah, I, I'm just on that. I'm just wondering, like, what have we learned from their use of CCIP read? Like, have we gotten feedback from them? Because, you know, they're just like the biggest users by a long shot of this system. So you were talking about, like, latency or other benchmarks. It seemed like the place to get the benchmarks would be from the, uh, like, Coinbase and Uniswap. Um, so those entities are, are implementing uh, ERC-3668 themselves, and this is essentially a more generic open source end-to-end uh, -end, um, implementation of kind of the, the contract side as well as the HTTP server yeah. gateway side of things. Um, I am not party to kind of any conversations that they've potentially had with other ENS entities in the production of those um, products, but in principle, kind of happy to communicate with them and uh, on board them to, to utilizing this and contributing to it. But I, I imagine um, that the, the reasons they've built it all in-house is, um, well, I, I, I don't know why. <laughs> so the current, as far as, I don't, we haven't seen their code because it's not open source, but their CBID itself is using the uh, off-chain signing. So it, it doesn't even store on the uh, blockchain. So all the EVM gateway is based on the fact that you put on L2 and we verify it. So all the code, they don't use it. So I think performance-wise, it, probably it's quite light because all they do is they just sign. So but like I think if they, once they move to the new one, uh, then we could ask to share the benchmark, but currently, I don't think they are, yeah, it's relevant. And they, they have yeah. expressed a desire to move to a trustless architecture rather than relying on signing. Yeah, and so to add to that, um, right now, these parties implement their own CCIP gateways. Um, Coinbase is, is open source, actually, I think, and it's written in Go, um, but we have one that's written in Rust, we have one that's written in JavaScript, and we have a package that you can use to make your own. Um, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, but with regards to the EVM gateway, the, the end game for um, 
multiple of these partners, Uniswap, Coinbase, et cetera, is to move to an L2 and be able to use the EVM gateway to trustlessly load from the L2. And so there wouldn't be any more central servers involved other than the regular one of many relationship trust, trust model that we already have with ERC-3668. Um, just to, based on what Makoto said, in principle you could uh, create a verifier that verifies against a signed message instead of against a proof. Um, uh, and as well as that, in terms of the, the context of operating a gateway, this is all open source and in principle anyone can run a gateway. In practice, I imagine not that many entities will, and there'll be kind of um, uh, standardized uh, gateway addresses that are um, specified in the contracts that are deployed. Um, and we, as Unruggable, are planning on running uh, gateways for all of uh, the, the networks that we built um, verifiers for, and uh, we've been putting a lot of energy into the sort of the DevOps side of building resilient, uh, scalable, um, operating production ready gateways as well as, as building the actual code that they're running. It would be a lot of hoops to jump through to for signing a uh, signing a message to assert the route. You know, I, I pinky promise that this is the storage route that calculates all these other things when you could actually just sign the response instead. But for things like uh, things that aren't L2s like Polygon, for instance, being able to rely on a multi-sig signed L2 route means at least that you're not expanding your trust horizon beyond, you know, what people already are for bridges and so on. Yes, yes, and that just remind another addition to this code base is the ability to uh, specify context and constrain the responses that are allowed to be acceptable, so that you can't get stale results um, returned from gateways. Hello. So yeah. We at Linea have already implemented the, let's say, the first version of the EVM gateway. So I was wondering, like, do you already have a path to migration to the, basically, the old approach to the new approach that you are proposing? Um, yes. So we have. Uh, so the pr the premise of the the TypeScript and the Solidity implementations are so that you can build in. Um, JavaScript and then easily convert it over. But we do have uh, um, methods for converting your requests over and uh, we'll document it, but I'm also happy to chat with you and, and help you out. And, and similarly, um, we're pretty passionate about all this and uh, we're happy to kind of, we're an open door policy, so we're happy to discuss with entities and help them to onboard to utilizing this. And, and maybe a second question. So in the case of ENS, usually everything goes through Ethereum. So it's more like a bilateral Ethereum to L2 um, um, communication. But uh, you have uh, this, um, uh, if we want to go further with EVM, EVM gateway, like it would be great to have like cross chain communication, not only from L1 to L2, but cross L2s, which re requires proof which is the hard part to solve uh, on this. Do you have thought about that? And do you have like a, a solution? Um, so yeah, in principle, this can be run between any two EVM compatible chains. Um, whilst building this and creating some proof of concepts, I did deploy uh, verifiers onto an L2 and then um, data stores onto other L2s and test it that way, just so that um, it was live on mainnet chains, but significantly cheaper to deploy an interface with. Um, but yeah, in principle, uh, it will already work on any EVM, uh, on any pair of EVM compatible chains. You don't necessarily have to have uh, every chain anchored to every other chain. You could have every chain publishing routes on L1, and then your L2 to L2 link would basically consist of proving what the storage route of another chain is on L1 you know, via its own hash of what the L1 storage route is, uh, which adds more indirection and thus is more complicated. And it also means that you can't rely on the smart contract interface of these different L2s, because they all have different storage layouts. So it will definitely require extra overhead building code to understand all the storage layouts of all the L2s rather than just their public APIs, but it's doable. And I don't want to run before I walk with this one, but 
uh, Foundry, which I personally use for contracts, um, creates the various JSON files that outline the storage slots and storage layouts um, of deployed code. So it has crossed my mind as a potential project one day to try and build some sort of a tool whereby you can simply import that JSON and it will kind of give you the, the uh, storage um, slot layout and potentially generate this request code for you, uh, in simple use cases at least. Uh, can I ask some questions just about CCIP read in general? I mean, this is the topic, right, uh, for this session, okay. Um, is Chainlink still involved with all this? Uh, basically, Chainlink um, agreed to give ENS a grant if we called it CCIP read. No, yeah, I, I remember, but they also said they would provide developer help to this as well. Yes, they we, they haven't had much involvement since. So that's unfortunate. Um, is that something that is possible for us to tap into, or you just think at this point it's not going to happen? Uh, I think we have, a, we have a good relationship with Chainlink when it comes to using their existing infrastructure, so if we... Thank you. Uh, that would be... You know, it very very easy to arrange with them at, at you know on a, on a, a good basis. Like, but in terms of developer support, it's been fairly lightweight, really. Okay. So I had a couple of meeting with the Chainlink team a few weeks ago, and uh, they are very supportive for our initiative in general. It's just a distinguishing is that we call it CCIP read because it's a supplementary technology. CCIP is more or more about messages passing from. Uh, one chain to another, whereas ours is more like a query system. So for that, I think we don't have, so for the querying, CCIP, what CCIP read does, it's not something we can supplement with CCIP. But there are potentially the pro area that, so one of the architecture, uh, we, we have something called notion of uh, unify, where if you mint uh, ENS name on uh, ENS chain, if you wanna exit to L1, we have ways to do. That's where more traditional L2 to L1 messaging service happens. And that area is still not considered. And uh, one of the options could be using CCIP's, uh, you know, like a message passing. But like, again, depending on the chain selection, there are some chains have that functionality natively which satisfy all the, our criteria. If it's the case, we don't need CCI, necessarily need CCIP. But if we select chain which doesn't have that in general, the selection of CCIP could be an uh, option. So it's still, yeah, uh, there's a different, I think options are wide open. Okay. Do we know how many CB.IDs CB exist? The last time we talked to them, it was about four, four and a half million. So. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, and then there's uni.eth is also using CCIP read, correct? That, that's my understanding. And do we know how many of those exist? I don't know the exact number. I don't know, correct, what is it? More than half a million. More than half a million. So, um, and they're probably three months, four months old, you know? Um, yeah. So, Are there other major u users of CCIP read issuing subdomains like that? Like, where's the alpha? Uh, I don't think there's anybody at that scale. Um, those are definitely the two biggest as far as I know. But um, yeah, obviously we hope to, to add more. Yeah, I'll, I just want to say that I think that's, extremely incredible. That's like really, really, really big for ENS. Um, and I think we should talk about that more, like yeah, publicly. Totally. Like I just wanna say like CCIP read has been extremely successful for ENS. Yeah. Like just Coinbase alone, that, that's incredible. Yeah, and yeah. I would add too, I think one of the like challenges CCIP read has faced is the association to CCIP. And I think people get confused between the two if like Chainlink owns it or not. So one thing we've been thinking about is like how could it be packaged with other things to create like a new kind of like standardized interface that then could be branded in such a way that it's less confusing for people um, who are making this association between ENS and you know and CCIP from Chainlink. Should we give them their money back and change the branding? <laughs> I mean, uh, if we're getting nothing else, so the original deal it's good was that yes, they, they gave us a grant. Number one, we at the time we needed money. Right now we don't need money. So it was a different situation. Number two, the idea was they were gonna like help develop things, provide developer support, like even run things. And if that's not happening, then I'd say, you know, that branding is less important. It would seem less important, but maybe we can't take it back, but I don't know. Yeah. 
I think it's great that they funded open source, and then I think secondarily we can just figure out how to move it forward in such a way versus like kind of like retroactively trying to remove stuff. Yeah, I, Chainlink's been a great partner on a number of fronts, in, including you know um, the the Oracle we rely on for pricing and for for the their support of of CCIP read. But I kind of agree that that partnership hasn't developed. I, I'd be happy to rename it back to to Durin. Um, <laughs> yeah. I you know I'm sure we could find a million dollars to give to them to for the name. It seems yeah. a little over the top. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we, we're running short of time on this, uh, yeah. so we probably need but to move on to the L2 stuff. 